the private sector. Wimbiz is actually the first Nigerian NGO rated by NGO advisor and ranked as 428 worldwide. It is the only African and Nigerian affiliate partner and representative of the International Women's Entrepreneurship Challenge Foundation. Wimbiz is, of course, also a volunteer-based organization funded largely by donations and contributions by our members and partners, and is also a supporter for the Code of Ethics and Conduct for NGOs. For more information about WIMBIS, please visit www.wimbiz.org. In addition to that, I would like to introduce you to the Inspire Me Coffee Table Book, Volume 1 and 2. It features accomplished women in diverse careers, businesses, and professions from different backgrounds. They are making their mark in the Nigerian management business and public sectors. There's actually a bonus deal on at the moment. So if you buy both Volume 1 and 2, you get it for 20,000 Naira. Don't forget to purchase, kindly contact the number on your screen now. Of course, we wouldn't wear, be where we are now without the support of our sponsors, and we do have sponsors for this e roundtable. So we'd like to thank our sponsors, Julia Jacks Consulting, Tazali Magazine, as well as Travel Lab Nigeria Limited. Thank you so much for believing in the cause and supporting us in this time. So on to the hot topic of the day, finding joy in the juggle for balance, for mental health and well-being. Our two distinguished speakers are strangers to some, but very familiar to many. First off, we have Dr. Otefe Edebi. He's a psychiatrist and psychologist with over 13 years of experience in both mental health practice and strategic hospital management. In 2019, he moved to become the medical director of the Grace Hill Palace, a mental health hospital in Amuwa Dauphine. And actually recently, the hospital and him have actually rolled out a very impactful initiative in light of social distancing. So Grace Hill Palace has actually leveraged modern technology to introduce telepsychiatry as a consulting service for persons who need psychiatry or psychological consultation. I'm sure he'll tell us more about that. So it's absolutely fabulous to have you here with us, Dr. Adebi. Thanks for joining us. And then next up, we have Dr. Kadiri. She's popularly referred to as the celebrity shrink. Dr. Mimuna Yusuf Kadiri is a multiple award-winning mental health physician and advocate. She's also the medical director and psychiatrist in chief at Pinnacle Medical Services. She's a consultant neuropsychiatrist and a fellow of the National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria. And in fact, she's often known as the only Nigerian with 11 Ps, i.e. physician, psychiatrist, psychologist, psychotherapist. I wouldn't reel off the rest, but I'm sure you get the picture. A very passionate public speaker, a Goldman Sachs scholar, Vital Voices fellow, and an Ashoka Change fellow. We look forward to hearing you speak. Thank you here very much for being with us, Dr. Kadiri. So one of the things we thought we would start with as part of today's discussion was to actually take a couple of live polls. So we'd like you all to join in with us. The first question we would like to ask today is, do you feel adequately supported to cope with the stress or pressures brought on by the current COVID-19 reality? And the answers will come up on screen now with a question, A, yes, B, no. We'll give you a few seconds to answer. I think by now we should be able to get a sense of the polls and what the responses are. Okay, so Wimbiz, I believe we're good to go. Can we see the results of the poll now? Oh, wow. Almost neck and neck. So 48% of people say yes, and a little over half, 52% of people say no. Very interesting. I'm sure our speakers will address some of those reasons behind the yes and the no, and particularly for those who say no. So one of the things that we've seen is that as countries have introduced measures to restrict movement, efforts to reduce the number of people affected by COVID, 
it's meant that we face new realities. What are those new realities? For some of us, it's working from home. For some of us, it's active temporary unemployment. It's homeschooling of children. It's lack of physical contact with other family members, friends, and colleagues. The time that we were very used to. And adapting to some of these lifestyle changes has actually meant we, first of all, have to think about how we manage the fear of contracting the virus. We worry about those who are close to us, and particularly the very vulnerable in our society and in our families. So these times have actually been challenging for us, and they can be particularly difficult for people who already have pre-existing emotional health or mental health conditions. But fortunately, there are lots of things we can do to look after our own emotional and mental well-being and recognize our trigger and our signals. And we hope that today you'll be armed with the tools you need to press on ahead successfully through the season. So we're now going to listen to brief introductory presentations from our panelists. And I'd like to begin with Dr. Debbie. He will give us his perspective both as a professional and more importantly as a man and a husband and a father. And we're going to hear specifically what some of the coping strategies he thinks should be brought to bear in this season. So over to you, Dr. Edebi. Thank you, Rolake. Thank you for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to first express my appreciation for being invited to be part of this roundtable this lovely afternoon. And um, I, I will just go straight into it. So thank you everyone for um, inviting me and having me. Um, so we're looking at the joy and the juggle, balancing your mental health in times like this. Um, mental health, it, someone once said this, it said, um, at every given time in life, you are either heading towards a challenge or you are currently going through a challenge or you are currently coming out of a challenge. So life is filled with challenges. Life is filled with um, tough times. Life is filled with traumatic events. Um, um, I'd like to tell you a story about someone who called me last week. Um, for, for the purpose of our conversation this, eve this afternoon, I would just like to call her Shelly. So Shelly called me last week, uh, I think it was on Monday, and she said to me, Dr. Debbie, I just felt like talking to someone. Right now I am taking a walk and uh, I feel overwhelmed. Uh, my, my, I feel I'm feeling in terms of in my family life, um, things are not going well between me and my husband. It's been a sexless marriage for a while now. And then my kids, um, ha they're having challenges with getting, finding their footing in terms of the workplace, business, and doing, getting a job. And then um, she talked about her health and all of that, just feeling completely overwhelmed, completely overwhelmed. And as she spoke with me about her challenges, um, the marriage, then also one of the major things she mentioned was the fact that she felt that she was failing in her business. So she had started a business, had done it over and over again, and she literally had had to close down her business, which was relatively big. And then just saying, I'm just in a place where I'm well over 50. I'm not in the best of places. This should not be where I should be at this time. I didn't plan to be at this place this place in terms of my marriage, in terms of my how well my children are doing and my finances and all of that. And I, I, I'm calling you, Dr. Debbie. I really don't know what you will say or what you will do, but I'm just calling you because I feel overwhelmed. I'm tired of being strong for the family. I have to keep up my, a face for the family. I really don't know what to do. Um, and, and she broke down and she was crying. And, and in, the, in that brief moment, I was just thinking that as I was listening to her, what do I say? What, what can I say in this brief um, time that I have with her, this privilege she had given to me to share information? Because she just said, I just called you out of the blues, just wanted to talk to someone. And I was just, I don't, I, I, and in, in her own words, she said, I'm not even sure you have the answers to my challenges, but what can I do? Now, I'm going to share with you some things because I, I, I started out there because listening to me, it's, it's a large crowd of different people going through different challenges. In the course of this, in the last few weeks, as, as regards the lockdown and all of that, I've been opportune to speak with different organizations, different groups, both large groups, small groups, church groups, whatever, different groups. 
at different times. So I know that the challenges that we have are different. So I, I really can't start and being very specific because I have spoken with groups that are mothers with children with learning disability, how do they cope with their stress? You may just be listening out there and you may be in that category. So I'm going to just share some basic things that I feel that um, will be helpful. Um, I, I call them the essentials of building your mental resilience for optimum productivity. I had a webinar recently, over 250 people registered for that webinar. And um, you're going to have the link at some point where you could just go and I believe it will be quite resourceful uh, um, tool for you to watch on YouTube. So I'm going to just share five things. First things first is that your mental health is important because mental health is not just the presence or the absence of mental illness. You don't have to be, uh, you can be mentally healthy even though you have a mental illness, a diagnosed mental illness. And you could also be mentally unhealthy even though you don't have a mental illness. So because mental health, as far as the World Health Organization defines it, mental health is your capacity to optimize your potential. It's your capacity to contribute um, to your community. It's your capacity to work productively and fruitfully. And it's your capacity to cope with the normal stress of life. Those are the four components that makes for your mental health. And so I will just talk about Five tools. I shared 10 tools in, in my uh, video, but I'm, I'm going to just share just five tools here. Number one tool that I shared with Shelly, because I called that today and I said, how do, so we spoke and after our conversation, I said, I feel much better. Um, and I called that, this is over a week after I said, how are you doing? How are you feeling? I said, I feel much better. I'm doing much better. I'm not feeling overwhelmed. I feel I can take on the challenges. I feel I will come out of this, come strong, come out strong. So let me just share with you some tools that I shared with her, and I think it may be helpful to someone out there. First things first is the first tool for building mental resilience, to going through tough times, not just to survive the times, because let me quickly say this, a mental resilience is not just your, it's not just going through, it's not just the outcome, it's not just saying that I have been there, I've done that, but it's about the process, because some people go through challenging situations, they come out on the other side, but they go through a lot of maladjustments, a lot of, um, um, they, are, they are literally broken through the process. So I am not just talking about surviving. You know, people say, oh, I survived, I'm a survivor. I'm not just talking about being a survivor, but I'm, I want to focus more on thriving, not just surviving. In other words, coming out of the traumatic event, coming out of the challenging event, it could be positive, it could be negative, but if that situation is challenging, I'm not just talking about coming out having survived it, having been passive through the process, but actually coming out, thriving and being a victor through the process. So the first thing I would like to share is information. Information is very powerful and that is one way you deal with your challenges. So get informed. Somebody once said something, he said, if you've done all that you know and all and it's still not working, you've done everything that you know concerning that challenge, I mean, you've made it to a, a challenge with your child, challenge with your job, challenge with life, whatever it is, a spouse, you've done everything that you know and it's still not working, then perhaps all that you know is not enough. So information is a powerful tool. Uh, this, this webinar gives us a platform and I'm sure we've had so many this things. So go for information in whatever area you may be struggling with, whatever challenge you may be going through. The first thing, I wouldn't say maybe necessarily the first, but one important thing that you need to get going through life is be informed, be informed. There, there, there is, I always say that, look, why is it the first, why is the first child most difficult or the first job or when you get promoted or you start out the business or you are doing operating at a certain level, very challenging. It's because you are not experienced in that level. So if you get information, that kind of strengthens you and makes you go through the challenge. Why is COVID? Why is COVID a challenge? COVID is a challenge simply because it's a novel situation. It's something that is new. We, we are not informed about how best to deal with this. So you want to get information. That is the first thing. The second thing you want to do is you want to do something I call reevaluation. You want to reevaluate the situation. One of the best gifts you can give to any individual is something called the gift of perspective. How do you see the problem? Every event, every challenge, everything that, come, that you come up against is in itself neutral. 
is in itself neutral. It is the where you, what you focus on and the interpretation you give to that event that determines the feeling that that event brings to you. I'll give you a simple, listen, back in those days, I used to do exercise and when I'm walking on the, on the road, you know, and I, well, because of my size, I don't really run. I'm just walking around. I'm not that big, but, you know, just lazy sometimes walking. You know, some other people doing exercise will jog past me and then they will clap their hands. And I used to feel really upset that what's your own? Leave me alone. I mean, jog. Why are you clapping? Why are you clapping? Just, you know, until one day I was talking with my wife and I said, why do people clap? They should mind their own business. If I'm walking, what's their business? You know, I said, maybe they are just cheering you on. Maybe they are just saying hello my fellow exercise body or something you know so all i needed to do was i needed to change my perspective change how you see that problem so one of the things i said to shelly was that change how you look at the problem you know take your focus off what is not working reevaluate the situation take your focus off what is not working and focus on what is working you know something sometimes something basic so you look at that challenge and say what can i be grateful for for. What can what meaning can come out of this situation? So reevaluate the situation. Like they often say, it could be half empty or half full. So you want to reevaluate this situation. The third thing that you, that you need to do, one of the powerful resources for building mental resilience, regardless of the circumstance of the challenge, is something I like to call connection. So the first thing I said is information. The second thing I said is reevaluation. You want to reevaluate the situation. What what are you focusing on? What interpretation are you giving to that event? How else can you see the event? What you know? You what what? You just want to look at it in a different way. And then when you begin to look at it a different way, it begins to take on a different meaning. The third thing, like I said, is connection. You want to find someone to connect with. Now, when it comes to connection, it's important to say this. Connection is not just about having people around you. So you could be someone that has a large group or a large family. Maybe you come from a big family or you belong to a faith group or something that you have a lot of people around you, but you don't necessarily connect. Now, I'm not just talking about having a group around you, but I'm talking about having connection, connecting with people, learning the art and being intentional of being of connecting with people. It saves you a lot of things. You know, there's a saying that don't travel alone. Don't go through this alone. You know, that's one of the powerful things about Wimbiz. It's a, it's a platform to connect with people. So connect with people, connect with friends, connect with mentors. One of the things that have helped me through this time, especially during COVID, was just to watch my mentor, just watch what my mentor was doing. And then I could see that my mentor was not slowing down. My mentor kept pushing on despite the challenges, despite the, the fears, the concern about business and all that, he kept pushing on. So just having a mentor, just having a friend, someone you can connect with. Someone said it this way, said, connect with people, um, with people so much so, so much so that they can hear your voice even when you are silent. You know, you need to have that level of connection. Another, the fourth thing, that I would say. So first thing is information. Second thing, reevaluation. Third thing is connection. The, the fourth resource is something I call affirmation. Learning to speak positive words over yourself. So those were some of the things I shared with Shelly. Shelly like I said, Shelly for the purpose of this conversation. Learn to speak good words. Some people, some people find it odd. Some people find it awkward. Some people find it like an overkill. You know, why should I say positive things? Things are not working. Things are going bad. You know, um, things are not, you know, people just go on and on and see those things. But learn to say to yourself, I'm going to come out of this. I'm going to come out strong. I'm going to come out, you know, victorious. I'm going to, I'm going to thrive. My business is going to thrive. My family is going to thrive. I'm doing well. I'm strong. I'm a strong person. I'm bold. You know, whatever. Just learn to speak over yourself positive words. Now, tr these things may sound like things that you've heard before. Of course, they, they are all, they are not necessarily new things, but it's not so much about just hearing them. It's in the practice of them. So learn to speak in your quiet place, in your, in the public place, quiet place, private place, public place, learn to speak good, positive words over yourself. Learn to 
Um, and uh, affirmation has been reset, it's reset based. Everything I've said is reset based. Connection is a powerful tool. Affirmation is also reset based, has been shown to improve health, has been shown to improve stress when you learn to speak words. So instead of just let allowing yourself sink into that stressful situation, you speak positive words over yourself. And then the fifth and the final thing I would like to mention for the purpose of this conversation, um, resources, like I said, I talked about 10 um, resource, um, resource tools for building mental resilience that helps you to optimize your productivity regardless of the challenge, whether it's COVID, whether it's a family situation, whether it's a financial situation, whatever it is. The, fe the, the fifth and final thing is meditation. Um, in the midst of everything, personally, as um, the, the challenge of COVID started out, I, I was thinking about my business, thinking about how do you, how do I thrive in all this in this moment? Meditation is just the art of learning to quiet down everything and just focus your mind on something. Now there are various forms of meditations, various forms. There are prayer meditations, there are formative meditations, there are Asian meditations. Find what kind of meditation works for you and apply them. Out of meditation sometimes comes out inspiration. And in times like that, so having shared these things, it's not so much about knowing them. There are five other things I will not mention. So things like organization, learning to be organized. One of the things that I heard over and over as I interacted with a lot of organizations during this period, some people said, look, we are working from home, but we are working more than we used to work even while going to um, um, our place of work. So learn to be organized. That's another thing, organization. So it's not enough to just know these things you should practice them. It's not in the hearing, but it's in the doing. And if you practice them, I assure you, you will do just fine, regardless of the circumstance, the challenge. And when I called Shelly today and I said to her, so how are you feeling now? I said, well, I'm feeling much better because I've taken my eyes off. Remember I talked about re-evaluation. I've taken my eyes off my challenges and I've put my eyes on the things that are working. I've listed out 10 things I'm grateful for and I'm just expressing that and i said you know why you need to do this when i spoke with her last week i said yes it may not be connected to your current challenges but we are th but when you take your eyes off the challenge and begin to reevaluate the situation what will you will experience is this you will experience joy in the present and when you have joy in the present regardless of your storm regardless of your challenges regardless of your stress your mind will become creative because when you are overwhelmed with stress and overwhelmed with all of the things that are, you know, just piling up on you, you become less creative and you enter survival mode. So all of this I've shared is how to go from survival mode to thriving mode. The conversation is not just for you to survive, but for you to thrive. I'll leave you with these four things. Um, how do I know when it's now out of hand? First thing is, is your thoughts. So mental health is about your thoughts your mood and your behavior if the thought the mood and the behavior becomes dangerous it becomes distressing it becomes a deviation and if 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 it comes to that if if this thought you have is distressing dangerous and and, and it deviates from the normal then you need to seek for help okay so that will be all for me for now i hope you um, picked some things that could be very useful information. Number one, number two, reevaluation. Number three, learn to connect, connection. Number four, affirmation, learn to speak good words, strong words, positive words over yourself, over your mind, and that helps you to deal with your stress. And number five, meditation. Thank you very much. Back mm. to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Debbie. I mean, that was really practical. I love the five tools. I'm sure before the end of the session, people would love to hear what the remaining five tools are, but they can always tune into your webinar uh, that you did last week or so. I'm going to come back to you to tease some questions out after we've had the opportunity to hear Dr. Kadiri. So I'm, I'm going to bring Dr. Kadiri on now. And Dr. Kadiri, as you're launching, I'm already seeing some questions about the sharing of domestic work, dealing with teenagers. People are already asking some pressing issues. And in fact, I think the same person is asking a lot of the questions. So people are clearly going through challenges. And I want you to also address women specifically, who in our society also carry additional burdens. 
um, based on your experience, what has worked? And can we actually really find joy? What is this balance thing that everybody is always talking about, balance? Over to you, Dr. Kadi. Good afternoon, lovely ladies. Um, I don't know how many men are here with us, but let us acknowledge Dr. Debbie. Um, at least we are obvious that is amongst us. There may be some other men that are silent, and um, we give kudos to them if a man joining us. Um, we can't be whole without, you know, the men in our lives are very important. But of course, to you, the woman here, I will tell you, you are a well-organized man. And I will say, even if we are going to clamor and clap for all our front line heroes, you are also a hero because if you are following all the government rules in helping to break the chain of transmission, you are helping to cope and fight this COVID-19. It's a novel virus. Nobody has ever experienced a pandemic before, but now we are all in it together. And collectively, we are dealing with trauma. So you are not alone. I'm not alone. It's not your fault. It's not my fault. But right now, how do we find joy in the midst of chaos? How do we find mental balance? How do we ensure everything we are doing goes in a way that will make us productive, will make us keep calm, we put our emotions on the wrap. And like Rolike said, we thank you for the introduction. Of course, thank you, of course, to my Wimby's family for this platform. Um, the timing is right. And I would say um, at this point in time, um, e-conferencing e has come to stay. I don't know if we ever go back to our normal roundtable discussion, how many people will want to come around. But let's know that this is temporary. Pandemics are never emergency. They come and go. So this too shall pass. I will go back to that period that we truly, really enjoy. You know, mingling, hugging, and, you know, shaking hands and doing all the old one bears. But this is 2020. By December 2020, now everybody saw it as 30 December. We had a lot of fun, and then everybody was looking forward to the you know, new decade. So people say, no, it's not a new decade, but most people felt it was a new decade because this is 2020. And we had all our hopes, the new year resolutions, all the plans to travel to Bali, to Fiji, to Chinchas, wherever. And you know, everything was all planned out. But now, there was an interruption. And when interruption comes, some people will freeze, some people will, you know, there'll be a flight, some people will, you know, uh, fight. It's just like having a lion come into your room. What do you do? Do you freeze? Do you run? You no, know, that flight mood, or do you even just, um, you know, be in a, in a particular situation where you don't even know what to do? So this is what this interruption has come to, you know, this, at this point in time. But at the end of the day, how are we making do with what we have? How much are we prepared for this period? Nobody was absolutely prepared. Things came and then we are just looking at how we are moving from time to time. So people were prepared, maybe for many other reasons. So the first question I want to ask my lovely ladies today in this group is that when we all had our strategies on building businesses, on putting um, the right things in place, getting more customers, um, opening up new branches. How many of us had a mental health strategy? If I want to even narrow it down, or uh, I've narrowed it down to mental health strategy, how many of us even had a health strategy for yourself, for your family? How many of us have even done our health assessment for the year? You no, know, it's also very important to see where we put on a lot of energy and how we want to have diesel for our generators, how we want to pay our rent, how we want to ensure we, we, we you know, send our children to the best of schools, we get the best of bags and best of corporate um, wares for our meetings, for everything. But many of us don't invest in our health. And if we have narrowed down to our mental balance today, let's narrow it down to our mental health strategy. I have to let us know, this is my 117th webinar since the COVID-19 started. Some days I just zoom out completely, like literally, because it is so enormous that you know, organizations were shattered, they didn't even know what to do. I, I had spoken to organizations that we had over almost 5,000 people. In fact, all manner of apps I discovered this period from Webex to Microsoft Teams to go to Witty to go to Webinar. I can't even imagine and the apps I had to join because a different organization had their different, you know, 
um, uh, application that I needed to use. From parenting issues to relationship issues to maladaptive coping mechanisms to working remotely, for parents that are on this platform, you know, managing our children online schooling, you, you don't even go there. You know, now we are working remotely, the schools are making it also to, 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 to help our children to, to do their assignment, like my, my children's school, I'm in Corona, so I'm a Corona parent or two from primary to secondary. If they have invested, maybe I'm a join because I'm a full-time uh, self-acclaimed ambassador. The thing is that Corona, all this, whatever we are doing, decided to do tests, like evaluation of what they have been doing over time. And they put up a Zoom class, they put up what a day one and day two. And you know, internet is not, not even our friend. So there were so many challenges. The first week they did it, it failed woefully. They had to re redirect and subsequent week that they now put it, we were able to. So I know there are so many people going through so many challenges right now. And it is not, it is unique to you. It is not a one-off. It is not a, a, a one-size-fits-all. Um, for the people living alone, people would, would say, oh, she's single. Um, she has no problem. Excuse me. This is the time for us that we think we are not single or we are married and we have those mentees that are living alone for us to check up on them because they are an endangered species right now because you know there was a whatsapp or uh, um, a viral a, a, a picture that went around that said you are free to talk to the walls talk to your uh, plants talk to your tables talk to you no know, fan it's okay to talk to them but the moment they start talking to you there is a problem and so these are the people that you find that they are in this precarious situation because we are dealing with unprecedented times and the devil know what to do so now let me tell you why we have to really work on where we need to put things in place. There are 26 alphabets, A to Z. There is B, there is C, and there is D. The letter between B and D is C. What does B stand for? Bet the day you were born. What does D stand for? Death the day you die. For you, C is what really matters. And what is C? The choices that you make. And right now, we have to make the choices that will make us productive, the choices that will keep us mentally stable, the choices that will have that better integration, the choices that will keep us balanced, the choices that will keep us grounded, the choices that will optimize to unleash our potential to be the best we are destined to be. Some businesses are thriving. Some businesses will never to surface again. Likewise, the way we see NCDC dishing out um, our, um, figures every night, green, yellow, red, people are dying. People will die. People are being discharged. We are happy. But how are you as an individual taking in and sucking in this whole situation and telling yourself, I will survive this? This is a year of survival. This is a year of staying alive. Leave all the projects, leave all the meetings. Yes, things will go, but if you don't survive and even go into the thrive mode, other things will fail. These unprecedented times have brought us a whole lot of challenges. And what are those, uh, those challenges? I'll go with an acronym, how this is affecting us mentally. And the acronym is what each and every one of us use nowadays ourselves, our children, everybody, even the anti or the street, they use the word pandemic, pandemic, because it's a new word we have all learned. Even if you're a head worker, you are just reaffirming yourself, oh, there's a new word called pandemic. And this is how this COVID-19 viral infection has affected us mentally, using the acronym pandemic. I will send it to the Wimby Secretariat, and maybe we have to post this, right? Um, if, in case you forget it, it's, it's for you to just have. The P is panic. A lot of us went to panic mode. Panic buying, panic, you know, hoarding, panic. You saw all the pictures and videos from UK and US. And we in Nigeria say, well, why are they stopping to shoot the fan all that? What is our problem with all these things? You know, of course, we were more of the sanitizers and the, all the other things. But there were a lot of panic buying. Some supermarkets went from 1 naira to 200 naira, hand sanitizer from 500 naira to 2,500 panic buying and some people actually went into a medical condition panic attack we were not sleeping well because the whole situation is novel is new and a lot of challenges came the ages anxiety p 
people went through it. Some people are still dealing with a lot of anxiety. So I wasn't surprised at the poll where 52 percent said the, um, the coping is, uh, mechanisms are not so good for them. But PA is anxiety. Anxiety and fear. It was torturous. It was it's humongous. Because even those that have children, the children are asking a million and one question, we don't even have answers for it. So the A is anxiety and fear. The end here is not sleeping and not eating well. How many of us in Lagos even eat and sleep well? I know we are all over in Nigeria, but definitely those of us in Lagos, before this law we read, a lot of our issues were just, you know, um, sleeping pattern was distorted. And now it's even worse. Because now working remotely, you will, you will tell yourself, okay, I will sleep and then I wake up. And it, it, there's so much. And through some of the symptoms that are not so common in COVID-19, mimic some of these things that I'm talking about. Loss of uh, smell and taste in the mouth. So the moment you start feeling certain things like that, it provokes and heightened anxiety too. What is the D? D is depression. Dear ladies and Amazons, my mentors, friends, and mentees, the truth is that there's an increase in the rate of depression right now. We are hoping that we do not end an era of and this um, global pandemic and begin another era, which is unknown, which is foreseen, but we are not yet prepared for it because the rate at which people are exhibiting depressive symptoms, depressive thoughts, and that leads us to the E, which is experiencing suicidal thoughts. Look at what is happening. People are angry. Twitter, the streets of Twitter is it's on fire. Rape cases of 20, 30 years ago, people are building them apart. A 65 year old even sharing that she was raped. Why? It's global pandemic. We have to stay home, we have to stay safe. No more where to watch movies, no more where to ventilate, no more where to socialize. So people are bringing up a whole lot, a lot of issues that they've dealt with. It's collective trauma, but we are all unique and we are dealing with it differently. And people are voicing that. And is it right for people to voice that? Yes. But we hope that they do not just remain on social media as hashtag actions taken against them so that we will deal with this situation and will not go into another pandemic. So depression is E, a D, and E is expressing suicidal thoughts. Before now, for every 40 seconds, somebody somewhere is dying from suicide. And what about now? There are a lot of cases, and they are not going to be part of the statistics of COVID-19, but people are dying silently. The ease of the love that can tell you there are a lot of people dying in at home, and we are not even seeing all these challenges. So experiencing suicidal thought is on where this COVID-19 is affecting us. The end here is maladaptive coping mechanism. There's increasing rate of taking alcohol, caffeinated drinks, and smoking with other substances. I know when it comes to ladies, more even before now, people don't go to gyms. Ladies don't really visit gym because they are going to be looked down, you are going to be um, talked down to like somebody who's useless or doesn't have good home training or doesn't have good support. So you tend to see yourself buy drink while at home. And drinking alone is the worst form of drinking. Has it increased? Yes, because when the rule says stay home, stay safe, some rooms are not safe. Some people are not safe where they are. They are locked down in a domestic violent relationship. They are locked down in, in a toxic environment. And there's nothing really some of them can do about it. And these are the bad things that we are talking about. So maladaptive coping mechanism is one way this is affecting us. The idea is impaired thought processes. And what are these impaired thought processes? You can hear all the conspiracy theories from 5G to this to that, all manner of things that are happening. So this is one of the ways this is affecting us mentally. And the C is confusion. Some of us are still in that confused state. When will this end? How will this end? What, when, will, when will we ever get out of this? And we are not telling you. If the P A N D E N I C, you have ticked one or two of these boxes, what are you now going to do about it? And this is where we are not saying, let's find joy in, in, in the midst of chaos, let's find joy in the jungle, let's help us build mental um, balance and mental wellness, and of course, mental resilience, like what Dr. Ebbi has said. At this point in time, we need all hands on deck to say, this we, we collectively want to work together to ensure that we achieve greatness. We do not just move from survivor to the try and to, we don't want to just be in the survivor mode. We want to be able to try. Let me tell you something about mental health. Some people have mental disorder, but they are surviving and thriving. And you'll be wondering why. That is because with the definition Dr. Debbie gave, and which is the World Health Organization definition, the ability to realize your potentials in life, the ability to work productively and fruitfully, the ability to 
uh, deal with the day to day stress and the ability to give back to the society. If you are coping, you may have depression, but you are, you are surviving and you are thriving. That is it. But some people may, be, may, not, may not have a mental illness, but they are not coping. So it's not just the absence of a mental disorder. Some people may not have a mental illness, but they're not coping because they're still in this confused state. They're having anxiety. They're they having negative thought processes. Now let's take it down before I round up this like 15 minutes. How do we now make sure that in this era, we have said this is how it's affecting us from parents to single people, to single parenting, to um, um, ladies working on their own that are not yet married. How can we now be able to deal with this, find joy in this whole um, um, jungle and you know, be more productive and, so, and thrive, not only survive. We go with the win this way. So W-I-N-B-I-Z, the win this way, will give us some tips on how we can manage this. And what is the W here? The W you, you here is worry less and live in the present. Don't worry about the future. You are not there yet. Live about the past. Use the pebbles, the mistakes of your past to build the future you want to see. But please live in the present. You need that. Because Dr. Kadiri, Dr. Kadiri, sorry to interrupt. You literally have one minute left okay, of your yes, 15 so, minutes. So I would so, advise yeah. that you rush through the women's, but please do, this, yeah. do rush through the acronym very quickly. Yeah. So the W is worry less and live in the present. The R here is imbibe good sleeping hygiene. So when those questions come in, I'm going to tell you what good sleeping hygiene is so that we can, it can be a take a home um, exercise for us. The M here is to maintain a healthy diet. It's good for us to eat, and we say in Nigerian context, belly food, but it's good for us to also eat healthily to boost our immunity. And that's even the way they say we are, we are to fight COVID-19 right now. And the B here is be a part of a community. Start with the Wendy's ladies and of course be a part of your estate community your school community any community that you know will help you you know as a healthy support system the idea is you know include 30 minutes work exercise on a day-to-day -day basis brisk work exercise it boosts your feel good hormones and you know those are end of things that will help to keep mentally stable disease is learn to zoom out Zone out to take care of yourself for self-care, for self-love. Zone out. It's not every time you want to zone in. Don't have the fear of missing out. Zone out for your mental well-being. So for now, I will end with that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Kaderi. Very, very powerful words. And thanks for the acronym. Very good for, for memories. Look, there are a lot of questions already piling up. So I'm actually going to just incorporate some of the questions already panel up with some of my own questions. And I'd like to go back to Dr. Debbie, please. One of the first questions we're already seeing coming up, a woman talks about the fact that she's valuing the importance of extended family. But here's the thing, she doesn't feel that the work at home is being equally shared between her and her husband. Because she's having to do, take care of the kids homeschooling, it's left to her at the end of the day, there's a cooking there, all these things. That's the number one thing. So from your perspective as a man, what does this equal partnership actually look like in the home context? Like for those who may be married, we'll come to the single people later, but I mean, what can people really do? Because women are naturally pushed into this default mode of being at service to everybody. What are your thoughts and what tips can you give this person? Well, for, for me, it starts with a conversation. Um, many times we assume, you know, we say the other person should know, you know, he should see me walking, but he should, he should feel that I'm stressed. So it starts out by actually having a conversation with your spouse. If you are stressed, because not everybody is, some other person can do it and handle it and may not be bothered. But if the person in question says, look, I am overwhelmed, then sit your spouse down and say, I am overwhelmed. Don't, he's not going to read your mind. You know, there's, there's a saying I heard many years back, and I love it so much. It says that action speaks louder than words, but words are clearer than actions. So rather than just saying he should read my action and he should get that I am stressed, he may even have read it and gets it, but still just want to be in denial. So you, Oga, I am stressed. You need, to, you need to weigh in. That's number one. And then maybe we need to actually have defined how it's going to work. 
So it's not just enough saying weigh in, because sometimes they weigh in and cause more confusion than, mm. than, than you know, they, they, they compound the problem. So you want to weigh in and be defined. Okay, this is how we're going to do it and all that. Now, then let me quickly add this also. If it's not in the person's style, maybe that's not his strong um, um, attributes to weigh in. When he gets it right, praise him for it. Don't say you have come to spoil it, you know. So encourage the person and then it helps. But you need to talk, have that conversation. Don't just stay there assuming. That's one of the things too I talked about in, in, in the, the resilience thing, which is confrontation. You have to know how to confront your, your issues, not just be passive and just hope and wish that the person gets mm. it, confronts the issue. Thank you very much for that response. And, and that is assuming that the husband and wife have good communication in any case between yeah. them, because that's another layer of communication, but we can talk yeah. about that later. The yeah. question I had for you, Dr. Kajiri, is as women particularly, how do we start recognizing those signals and the signs? Mm -hmm. and, and the reason I want to, I want to quickly let everyone know. So when I had my 16 month old, before I was discharged at the hospital, they gave me a form to fill about postnatal depression. And I was like, oh my gosh, here come this Westerners again. I filled it and I thought, you know, let's, you know, leave it there. A few weeks later, I get a letter in the post saying that the results of the questionnaire show that I'm borderline depression. I don't like, <laughs> what are these people talking about? But the point is, based on my responses, they would have seen certain things which they thought, you know, well, I can get this checked out. So the question I have for you, Dr. Kadi, is, yeah. How can we practically recognize the signals? Very, very important. Is it when we start shouting on our children, when we lose patience? What are some of the triggers that we need to look out for? Thank you very much. This question um, it keeps repeating itself in all my webinars. And the thing is that if you don't, if you're not able to identify what um, the triggers are, or if you know um, whether you are at risk there's no way you can resolve what you don't know and that's just the truth you are just going to live normally and just think everything is seen so for women that are in this forum we have what we call predisposing factors and we have what we call precipitating factors predisposing are things that happen as when you're a child things normally that were not within your control so we call them adverse childhood experiences things that you know for example, some of those factors are death of one or both parents. You didn't kill your, your parents, of course, but no child wants to have their parents or parents die. So death of one both parents. So I will talk of the risk factors, then I'll talk about um, things we should watch out for. Because if you don't know the risk, if you're watching out for certain things, you may not know the, the impact it will have on you. Because for those that are more at risk, the impact is more. So, the child, adverse childhood experiences, which we call predisposing factors, are death of one or both parents, coming from a home where there's domestic violence. So you see this domestic violence thing? <laughs> um, it follows people for long. So coming from a home where there was domestic violence, death of one or both parents, child sexual abuse. So you see this? So when I come on Twitter or on my, on my social media pages and talk about rape, I'm talking about that five minutes experience that this man had 20 years ago, that left this girl traumatized and damaged for a lifetime. Because now she's sitting in front of me and we are doing therapy. Maybe the man is dead, or maybe the man is somewhere else, or the family members have even forgotten about this rape case. But this person is still living with that trauma for the rest of her life. So child, uh, um, child sexual uh, abuse coming from a dysfunctional family setting where father will say yes, mother will say no. And so there's that dis no discord. No, they're not taking, they're not speaking one voice. So the children become manipulative. They know when to watch TV because daddy will say yes. They know when to play outside because mommy will say yes. So these, all these are childhood experiences. And one other thing we must not forget is uh, in, um, a positive family history. Just the way you have hypertension, diabetes, asthma, sickle cell in families, mental illnesses can be in families. And of course, the precipitating factors range from relationship issues to financial issues to job dis dissatisfaction to unemployment and so many other vices. And now, let us now go down to what are the things you should watch out for. Sadness for a day or two is not depression. It's not mental illnesses because they are taught influence your emotions and your emotions influence your behavior. Your thoughts influence your emotions and your emotions influence your behavior. So sadness for a day or two is not depression and it's not tagged as a mental illness. But when it's persistent for a minimum of two weeks, sometimes you recognize it, sometimes somebody recognizes it for you. 
So sadness for a minimum of two weeks, loss of energy. So you wake up, you don't even have energy, you are lethargic, you don't even know what to do. Then loss of interest in things ordinarily you love to do. No mm. more one best now. No more. Mm. So, oh, so these are the three major symptoms. But of course, I would say there are numerous minor th- uh, symptoms we should watch out for. And these numerous minor symptoms, they mimic malaria, they mimic COVID-19, they mimic uh, many other medical conditions, like poor concentration and attention. You hold your phone and you're asking for your phone. You hold your car keys, you're asking for your car keys. You are not sleeping well or you're even oversleeping. When you oversleep, you are trying to sleep away the problems. But the moment you wake up, your problems wake up. So some people mm-hmm. may think that you are sleeping for 20 hours. But one thing that comes to sleep is that watch out for one significant thing. Is it refreshing? The moment your sleep is not refreshing, even if you sleep for 24 hours, you are having poor quality mm-hmm. of sleep. Yeah. So poor sleep or oversleeping, not eating or overeating. So you may have a friend who, a friend who is not increasing in weight. And you say, oh, you are enjoying, but the friend is telling you, I'm stressed. And you are just thinking the friend is lying. Emotional eating, those are some of the things you can also watch out for. But sometimes mm-hmm. it can get to an extreme situation. And yeah. what is the extreme situation? When you start hearing voices, when you start seeing strange things, when you start becoming suspicious or paranoid about people around you, mm. girl, lady, mommy, it's time to get help. Time to get help. Thank you so much for that. And we're going to obviously break up the conversation, but I can see somebody is asking for you to just quickly recall the WIMBIS acronym. If okay. you can just quickly recall. <laughs> quickly, okay. Yeah. So, W-O-K. Yes, if somebody has written, worry less and live in the present, invite good mm-hmm. sleeping hygiene, maintain a healthy diet, be a part of a community, include 30 to, uh, 20 to 30 minutes, a uh, brisk work exercise on a daily basis, zoom out for self-care zoom and out. self-love. Yeah. And that can literally be <laughs> zooming out from a yeah, webinar yeah, to Zoom. Yeah, but true. <laughs> so, we're, we're, we're going to do the actual audience Q&A now, and Thanks, guys, for really staying engaged. I can see quite a lot of chat. It's such a pertinent topic. We want to do one more poll before we move to the um, full audience Q&A, which will take place for another hour. So don't worry, we'll get to your question. So I'm just going to ask the WIMBIS Secretariat to bring up that poll now on the screen. And we'd like as many people to take part. So Secretariat. So the question is, in your opinion, which one of the follow areas is topmost of your mind given the current reality? First, managing your family relationships. Two, childcare and parenting or online schooling. Balancing and sharing chores. Coping with workplace demands, staying relevant at work, it may even be redundancy. Finding time to rest or sleep, that was mentioned. Financial strain and difficulties or anxiety over the risk of catching COVID-19. So in your opinion, which one of the following areas is topmost of your mind now, given the current reality? We'll just take another 30 seconds or so for people to respond and then we'll see the results. I must also mention that these things are not necessarily mutually exclusive. They're they're all sort of interlinked um, into one another. I think we can show the poll results. I'm not seeing here the level of completion on my side. So perhaps Wimbiz, you want to be able to make that call for me so we can move on. Yes, so can we see the results? Oh, wow, okay. We had roughly 191 people take the poll which is over half of our current participants. So not too bad a reflection. And the result was that 45%, it's not a huge figure, were about coping with workplace demands. Very, very interesting. And I think it just goes to show that people are literally trying to balance because one of the ways you struggle to cope with workplace demands is that you have other demands at home that you're also trying to cope with. So all these things are intertwined. So thank you for participating audience. We can, we can, look at maybe 34% say financial strain and difficulties. And again, those two things are probably quite closely correlated. And other things like childcare and parenting. Okay, thank you very much, Wimbiz. I think we can take that off the screen now. 
Okay, I just wanted to take time to thank our sponsors again, Julia Jacks Consulting, Talazi, and Travel. Let me just recall the name so I don't get it wrong here. Uh, Wimbys, you might even want to put that on the screen so that we can um, just thank them properly. So they are, just give me a second. Yes, so it's Julia Jacks, Tuzali Magazine, and Travel Lab Nigeria Limited. That's it, yes. Julia Jacks, Tuzali Magazine, and Travel Lab Nigeria Limited. So please check them out, check out their website. So let's get down to the Q&A now. So one question that came up in the Q&A was dealing with teenagers. Somebody was really concerned about the fact that their teenager who has not had, obviously, the opportunity to go out and play with their friends is probably acting a bit depressed. Now, it could be everything from locking themselves in their room, not really talking, not really engaged, maybe constantly listening to music or watching movies. How do you cope with children and especially young people, teenagers in this climate? number one and then i'm going to sort of intertwine that with another question it's going back to the domestic chores issue and there was an issue around communication right with spouses i think it's easy to assume that spouses even before COVID times had good communication flows but that may not be the case some people may actually already be difficult relationships and this has compounded it and of course we've heard about domestic violence going on and then I read one of the comments where somebody said her, her young child came to us and said, can we have a coronavirus party? And I think that shows that children and young people are coping in different ways. So I, I want both of you to speak to those two stakeholders, the spouses and the children. And I'd like to start with Dr. Debi there, particularly the question around teenagers. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I was going to talk about, um, I'm going to talk about the teenagers, but if you don't mind, let me, let me talk a bit about communication. Now, I, I like the fact that you said it was an assumption, which is good because um, for me, when you look at the whole COVID thing, it's not just about COVID. Sometimes COVID just brings um, to bear already existing issues. So um, let me give my humble self as an example, my wife has been home for like eight weeks now, uh, like, well, yeah, two months, eight, that's, well, yes, well over eight weeks, and she's having the time of her life, as far as, as, far as she's concerned, she's the head of HR, she would love to stay at home and continue staying at home, so it's not just about staying at home or not being at home, for some people, the home is not a safe place, for some people, it's a wonderful place, you know, so, yes, I may assume that um, you have good communication, but if you don't, then it's not about the lockdown. It's not about the being overwhelmed with the work. That's why I said you need to have a conversation because you see, maybe all this while you have felt that conversation means I will just act out in a particular way, then my spouse should get it. So that's not nothing about communication. You need to talk because many people don't talk and they assume that the other person will get it. So if it is really, um, communication is a big thing altogether that we can go into and start talking about how to have effective communication or what I love to call how to have healthy conversations in marriage. There are things that you need to do and put in place if you find yourself in that situation. So what I would quickly say as far as that is concerned, you may need to talk with somebody else. If you've done everything, remember one of the things I said was information. If you've done everything and your communication style or you are not effective, then you may need to have somebody give you a different perspective on how to see the problem. I remember someone many years back, she told me, Dr. Debbie, you know, we're meeting for the first time and she just had the miscarriage. And she said to me that if I met you two years before now, my marriage would have been saved. But right now I am on my way out of my marriage. I don't, I don't want to do, I don't want to deal with this anymore. I said, well, I'm not going to tell you to stay in your marriage or leave your marriage because not as it was an abusive marriage, just that we are not communicating. There's too many conflict. People often assume that the presence of conflict means that you are in a bad relationship. Marriages don't break because of conflict. They break because of failure to resolve conflict. Very important. You know, so sometimes marriages that do so well is because they've learned the art of communicating. They've learned the art of 
thriving and all of that. So you may need to get information. You may need to get a counselor. You may need to get a therapist. You may need to speak to someone to improve on your communication style. It's not, so this particular person, we had a conversation, had just three sessions, you know, and then boom, six months later, I asked her, how are you doing? She said, well, my marriage is much better. All I did was just change how you communicate. So as for the teenagers going through their own challenges, one, you have taken note of what they are going through. I always believe so much in, it's not enough to just observe behavior. You must engage the person to make clarity on what the person is going through. So you must allow the teenager feel free to express themselves, feel free to express. So sometimes teenagers find it extremely difficult to express themselves because they feel that you may shout, you may snap at them, you may say, well, you are not the one dealing with the financial struggle. Yours is just to eat and be present. You know, I'm the one dealing with the stress and all that. So you may need to communicate with them, talk to them. So um, communication cannot be overemphasized. Um, speak with the person. Take out time to, to hang out with your teenager. So, you know, the, we, we are talking about social distancing. We are talking about, but we are not saying you should not connect to people. One, one thing I did the other day, I just got my kids, well, they're not teenagers yet, but one is 12. My older child is, is 12. And I got them into the car and said, okay, we're just going to drive around. And I'm just going to point at buildings and tell you stories about just find time to intentionally connect with your kids. For me, um, the lockdown is like a fantastic opportunity for people to begin to correct things that were not, well, that's the way we, the lockdown has been eased now, so let me stop stressing the lockdown. But the, it's, it's an opportunity to begin to readdress some of the things that were already missing in, the, in our homes. So co co connect with your teenager, be intentional, ask somebody else, what do I need to do? You know, what are you doing with your own teenager? This is my own challenge. So don't be, no man is an island connect with somebody and you will you will have answers on what to do. Thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Debbie. And Dr. Kadiri, I'm going to ask you, you can respond to some of that, but because we want to get through as many questions, I'm also going yes. to throw in this question of compartmentalizing as a wife and right. renewing yourself daily. Somebody said that, how do you actually compartmentalize? I think women typically tend to think through connection. So can you offer some specific tips on compartmentalizing as a wife? And also what actually constitutes a good sleep routine? <laughs> Thank you. Um, let, let, me step, let me start with the good sleep routine because I, um, I know quite a number of people are dealing with that. And when, when it comes to good sleep hygiene, um, some of us don't know how to you know, go way around it. So the first thing about achieving good sleep hygiene is to have um, to put a routine to it. When to sleep and when to wake up. So don't just assume whenever I feel like sleeping, I go to bed. And whenever I want to wake up, I wake up. Especially now working in remote, um, um, working remotely or not even working at all because depend on uh, the nature of your job or maybe you're an entrepreneur. So if you want to achieve good sleep hygiene, first rule, you've acknowledged it. Then put a routine to it. So whether you are not sleepy, you don't want to sleep, and you say, by 11 p.m. I want to go to bed, let it be 11, and then let, um, and by 6 a.m. you wake up. What that does for you is that it keeps you, uh, it regulates what we call the circadian rhythm of sleep, so that at the end of the day, when you now want to resume your nine to five or do whatever you want to do, it's not disjointed and you are not feeling um, overwhelmed. So the, that's putting a routine. The second thing is that don't sleep, don't eat too much, drink too much before your bedtime. So we are talking about three to four hours before you sleep. Don't eat too heavy. Don't drink. I'm not talking about, aside from water, even alcoholic or caffeinated drinks, don't take it three, four hours before. What it does for you is that it disturbs your sleep. So when you drink too much water, you'll now find out that maybe you used to wake up once to go and uh, um, to use the restroom. You now wake up three, four, five times. And what what happens to your sleep? It distorts you. You just you may even fall down because you may be feeling so sleepy and all that. So that's the second one. Don't eat too much. Don't drink too much before your sleep time. You are looking at three to four hours uh, before you go to bed. The third one is you will have to sleep in a relaxing, calming. Um, 
um, dim light or no light room. So there, I don't want to go into that topic, but there's there are lights that are good for your sleep, that enhance good sleep. Blue light is not good for you. And blue light is the light you find on your uh, laptop, your phone, your TV. So now, ladies, if you are married and you're in this forum, and for a gentleman that is here, your bedroom is your bedroom. It's not your TV room. Your bedroom is for two things. Intimacy, which is sex, and the second S is sleep, not your TV room. So for their TV, they're taking over the bedroom. The light that comes from that your TV is not healthy for you. The reason why anywhere you go to in the world and it's nighttime you sleep is because there's, there's what we call melatonin, which is a hormone that enhances your sleep. And that is why sleeping in a dim room or a dark room promotes sleep. So these are the basic things we want to say about good sleep hygiene. So when you go to bed and 20, 30 minutes, you are still on that bed, you have not slept. Dear sister, get up. When you get up, don't go to your laptop and your phone. No, because those ones will take you to social media and the sleep will completely disappear. Do things that will promote sleep for you to go back to sleep. Like read a book, take warm chocolate, have a warm bath, you know, things that will promote, not TV, not uh, um, um, laptop or your phone. So these are the things that we will we'll talk about when it comes to promoting good sleep. Then when mm. it comes to compartmentalization, when it comes to women, the society has put so much on us. We have our own issues. Don't forget as women, you are a daughter, you are a sister, you are, if you are married, you are a wife, then you are a mother, then you are a friend. Then of course, to achieve greatness and in that pursuit for greatness, you are a mentor, so you are an entrepreneur, you are a business owner, you are a CEO, so much. So how do you now ensure you put all these things in different compartments? So when it's time for you to be a mother, you are a mother. When it's time for you to be a, a sister, you are a sister. And that is why studies are now showing that the, 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 the word multitasking is a scam. It doesn't make you productive. You are going to be working so optimally not to that productive level. You have to do one thing at a time to see conclusion before you move into another thing. So you have to tell yourself, look at, for your productivity, look at the least valuable activities as against your most valuable activities. What are the least valuable activities? Things that you don't really need to do by yourself, that you can assess, that you can delegate, that you can get somebody to help you do. For example, easy shop, easy food. Sad that I don't know she's on this forum. She's my darling. I don't need to, I don't even know the road to my truck anymore. It's also sending this WhatsApp and she delivers them. So you need to know when to let go. You have to send your money message as a woman. Because in society, any bad child is your child. Anything that's not working is, where is the mother? It won't fit in, where is the mother? So you have to know when to let go and live in the present while you are still keeping your sanity. So I know a relative wants to stop me. So that yes. is for compartmentalization. No, and in <laughs> fact, I must say, this is the first time that I've heard that multitasking is a scam. A scam. <laughs> because I think it's the, the concept that, okay, women are strong. And we always say women have this special grace. They can cope with a lot. But I can see how that itself can be a really dangerous narrative for a lot of women's mental health. So thank you so much for, for mentioning that. Okay, so we have a question around dealing with redundancy and the impact of redundancy on, on your emotional and mental uh, well-being. That's number one. So I'm going to tie that in with another question. The second question I want to tie that in with is really around this whole issue of achieving perfection and the impact of social media. I saw a comment, comment earlier about the fact that someone advised we should suspend perfection in this season. I think we should actually try and suspend it in all seasons. But so I wanted to pose that to you and I'll come to Dr. Debbie about the redundancy question, both in terms of you yourself going through redundancy and having a family member you need to support, but even maybe as an employer, an entrepreneur. And someone mentioned the fact that the members of her team were made redundant, I think without her knowledge, and she then had to come and pick up the pieces. So maybe you can talk from both angles. And then Dr. Kadiri, if you can talk about uh, the second side around perfection and the stresses of social media. Dr. Debbie, over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I, I will speak from a personal place. So some years back, um, I, I, I had experienced, well, I've even experienced it twice, losing my job. I jokingly always say that 
you know, for some people, they lost, um, they left their jobs. For some other persons, which I fell into that group, the job left me. So it's not like I left my job, the job left me, you know, and it was a very difficult time for me. But in, th in those moments, I learned some of these things I have shared, where, whereby you learn to take your focus off um, what is not working. Because in those moments, you, you despair. It's normal. It's natural. So it's okay to cry. It's okay to be um, to, to panic. It's okay to be anxious. It's okay to fret over the future. But you can't stay in that mode forever. Because some people never recover. They say, oh, I lost a fantastic offer, a fantastic job, and they feel that that's the end of life. But sometimes those events, losing those things, actually open you up to something bigger if only you put your mind to it, if only you put yourself in that place and say to yourself that, you know what, um, I'm going to choose to be cheerful regardless of the fact that I do not have my job. You may say, how does that connect? Why should I even be happy? Why should I um, stay excited in those moments? One, it went, like I mentioned earlier, when you stay joyous or when you, you stay positive, let me just use that word positive, it helps you to be creative. It helps you to look at the same problem and then you begin to find solutions. So let me give you a practical, personal experience. When I was without job, Every time I woke up in the morning, every day, there was nothing like Tango this Friday. Every day was the same day for me. There's no Friday, no Monday, no Tuesday. It's every day is a reminder that I'm jobless. But one day it hit me that the fact that I had time on my hand, that time was a valuable resource that I could convert. So I said to myself one day, the doctor who works with the government or who works in a facility, um, you can't call him at 10 and say, come do a consult for me in my home or somewhere at 10 a.m or at 11, he has a regular job. So I saw that, I flipped that in my mind and said to myself, your time is, means that you can, you can do things that doctors who have jobs could not do. So that, be, that, become, that, that started my journey to see my problem from a different light. So you need to stay in that place. Then also when COVID, all this whole COVID thing started as a business owner now, so that's some years back as an employee. Now today I'm a business owner. I have employ, um, um, about an employer. And I'm thinking, how are we going to thrive? How are we going to survive? One of the things I did back then are some of the things I have literally shared. So first two weeks was panic mode. But then I started seeing opportunities in the small things. You know, I started seeing, you know, things that I would literally not pay attention to. I started seeing those opportunities. Because first of all, I had to calm the storm inside of me. I had to say, you know what, be quiet, uh, be composed. Then I began to say to myself, this which is some of the things I talked about, that not only would you survive the season, I know a lot of people say just survive, and it's okay if that's what you want, that's for you. But you can say, I'm not only going to survive the season, I'm going to thrive in the season, and I've seen that happen. So it is, it, yes, it may be uncomfortable, please cry, please you know, complain, please, please shout, but don't stay there for too long. You need to now get up and take action. You know, then another thing too is that you literally have to make adjustments. So maybe some things you could, um, you would outsource before, you know, um, call someone to do your laundry and all that. For now, just humbly do it for yourself. You know, make the adjustments. It's not forever. What, let me say this. There are three things we often say. One, we think the situation is pervasive. Two, we think the situation is permanent. And three, we think that the situation is personal. You think that what has happened to you is unique to you. It's not unique to you. You are not the first. You are not going to be the last. And whatever you are going through, the redundancy situation is only for a season. It's not forever. You know, that I learned. Those nine months of being jobless was one of the longest nine months. Looking back, it looks like it was nine years. But here I am. It's better. Mm -hmm. So, and when COVID started, one of the things I told myself, get your mind into a place of productivity. Get your mind where you say, I'm not going to come out just surviving. I'm going to literally try. Once your mind is there, what you literally experience is you, you see creativity set in. Mm -hmm. So don't just say, I'm going to survive. Well, if you want to say that, that's fine by you. I mean, everybody, you are free to say that. But like I said, my goal is not just to say, I want you to survive. I want you to try not just survive in this season. 
And then the second question is... Um, I was going to give that to Dr. Kadiri. I got too ex okay. excited, so Dr. Kadiri. I was, I was going to pass that over to Dr. Kadiri, but uh, you, the three Ps, we're, we're being blessed with a lot of acronyms today, <laughs> ladies. So please, Wimbis will do a job of trying to send them out to you, actually. Maybe that's something we can do. But he said, don't take it personally. Don't see it as pervasive and don't see it as permanent. Thank you very much yeah. for the three Ps. So, Dr. Kadiri, on the social media and the pressure of perfection, how can people deal with that? One rule for productivity is to see progress rather than perfection. Once you see progress, perfection will slow you down. Perfection will go in, take you into what we call an obsessive compulsive mode. Perfection will make you um, be... Um, uh, maybe recalcitrant as a team member or as, as a team player. But once you start seeing progress, it makes a whole lot of difference. And this is where it comes to the era of social media. I tell you, the way you do detox, it is also okay for you to do a mental detox, social media detox. And you can retire it to mental hygiene. And mental hygiene equates to the way you wash your hands with soap and water. The way they, they are telling us in COVID-19, wash your hands with soap and water frequently. You can actually do that mental detox or mental hygiene so that you will be in that safe space. Not all of us, you, if, you, if you think that you must always comment or jump into a trend or be in the front line or make a difference, don't forget the internet of things, don't forget. Now, say people that they are dragging for rape issues. They, Tweet, the tweet they said 2011, 2012, or whatever, they are bringing them back to life in 2020 and are telling them, you said this and now you are saying this. So we need to understand that, yes, social media is good. You must use it wisely. And social media will put pressure on you. We, make, we, we put tension on you. And like I said, this is our year of staying alive. The moment you start seeing yourself, comparing yourself to people that are doing exercises and put it on the social media, I've done my exercise 30 to 40 minutes, or I've done webinar and post all the whole uh, webinar of 3,000 people there, know that we cope differently. That may be their own coping strategy. That may not be mm. your own coping strategy. You are unique in your own way. So for that, know what works for you, harness it, and of course, ensure you maximize it. Not only survive, but of course, try. Yeah, and I'm really glad you mentioned the issue of social media as a double-edged sword. For some people, it's actually yeah. coping to be on social media as an outlet for their thoughts. For others, it's actually a no-no. No, no. Okay, so I want to shift to a different set of people today, and I want you to sort of address single people. Somebody asked a question about dating in the current climate. And the question was, how do we date and meet potential partners during this COVID pandemic? But I also wanted to throw some extras in there. A lot of single people find themselves in a situation where maybe they have to live alone or they live alone, they're separated from family and friends. And so they face a different set of challenges. For some of them, it's actually a good getaway from the world. So Dr. Debbie, I mean, you're married now, but I'm sure you were once single. Can you give us some, some, some thoughts and insights to what single people can do? And I'm sort of, to some extent, maybe not necessarily comfortable about necessarily putting them as a separate bucket because there's nothing wrong with being single. So why yeah. focus on them? But they do have specific challenges, yeah. right? So can we talk about that? And secondly, can we actually give people tips for dating? And maybe that comes from the angle of making virtual connections or yeah. using dating apps or finding more creative ways to keep in touch with your loved one or your partner. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So like I said, you reevaluate the situation. If it's not permanent, it's not gonna be, you know, we say it's the new normal, but like some also say, it's the new but temporal normal. So it's not like it's going to be forever. Don't worry, those of us who want to connect, we will connect eventually. But for now, can we just get to know the person? So make the best of the situation. I would say, even though I may be joking about it, but I would say that, okay, so it's an opportunity to do conversations for now. Okay, so you want to know someone, you want to get to know someone. I mean, you could still meet, just make sure you do the one meter, uh, like that, according to NCDC, you know, do the one meter, do a lot of talk, get to know each other, 
and all of that. And um, I, I think it's it's not that deep because if, if let's if we want to be very practical, they say um, not more than twenty people should gather in one place. So except you are doing a twenty sum, if you understand what I mean, I don't think you have a problem with actually meeting one person one on one. So it's not that deep. I don't think we should uh, make it that complex. Okay, but Dr. Kadri, can you give us, give single people, um, or even, let's, let's even break it down to the reality. There's some people who are planning to get married in the season. And I was asking an event planner recently on a webinar that how she's supporting her clients emotionally. Marriage for some people is a monumental life transforming event. Your plans have basically been scuppered. How do you even cope in that yeah. as a single person wanting to transition into this phase of your life? Yeah. So let's use the ABC approach. There's an ABC approach I want, and anybody can even invite, whether you're single, you're a single friend, you are, you are married and you are a couple. The first, the A here is accepting that this is our new reality, not necessarily agreeing with it, but acknowledging it. That way, it keeps you grounded. Remember, Wedding is a day, marriage is for life. So if you decide and tell yourself right now that it's not about the wedding as per se, let me focus on my marriage. So people are doing Zoom wedding. Why some people are saying, let us just do the 20 people together and then later we'll do the big gathering. It is okay. I have personal experiences which I may not necessarily want to share in here where, in fact, at a point in my social media, I think I put it out last week where I said, the, the groom is on the platform. And the groom said, let's marry. The girl said, no, let's postpone to 2021. Right now, a girl is pregnant for him. And um, this is a mess right now. It's a mess because the guy is, 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 is running into together. Family members are trying to get everybody, you know, to tie things down. And the girl that is pregnant, who is an ex-girlfriend, said, look, I don't really care. Um, I just want to, you to know that you are the father of the child and, and I can take care of my child and my baby. And, you know, so we need to know how to flip our thoughts. You know, if you think it may be a problem, if you keep it to 2021, do what you have to do now and leave all the gliss and glamour. You'll be fine. You get what I mean? But if you think it's not a problem and you have communicated, both of you are on the same page on postponement of the wedding. It is okay for you to postpone it and then do other things you have to do. But for the single person, that accepting that this is a new reality, not necessarily agreeing for acknowledging it is very important. The big part of it is behaving productively. All productive behaviors will not take us anywhere. It will keep us grounded, it will make you angry, it will make you irritable. And all productive behavior will make you call for a pity party which you do not necessarily need. What is that one thing that you can do every day that will make you productive? That is one statement you have to ask yourself. What is that one thing that can do every day that will make you productive? And the same part of it is controlling your upsetting thoughts. This thought will come. You are angry, you are alone, and all that. But then I'll say, why don't you leverage on, on social media? At this point, there are Zoom parties, there mm. is the uh, um, uh, house party app. In fact, I had an experience with doing therapy session with somebody who talked about house party app, and I was amazed. He's recently divorced. He went on the house party app. He met a girl on the house party app who is single. The girl has moved in with him now during the coronavirus issue, whatever, and they are actually planning marriage. So it's not all doom and gloom. Some people are having it. So just look mm -hmm. at all the things that will work for you as an individual, as Memuna. What are the things that will work for me, not as Rolete? Because you are different, you are unique, and don't compare. The moment you start comparing, you lose your focus, you lose your goal, and that mm. will give a lot of anxiety. Yeah, thank you very much for those thoughts. Very, very deeply insightful. So I'm not seeing some new questions come up, but there are some additional things that I want to ask here. Um, recently, there was a lady in the news, and I think her name was, I think we talked about this yesterday, Fumi Adisa. I think that was her name. The lady who, um, I, I think what happened was that she killed her infant. Yeah, yes, that, yes, yes, yes. Killed that baby, and, yes, killed that baby. And one of the things we were saying is that some of the signs would have been there before. And, you know, as someone who, and I'm sure there are a lot of us who do this, when we go for our annual health checks, we check our lungs, we check this, is how 
just going back to this issue of recognizing signals and signs, and, and someone had mentioned mental health assessment, whether she needs it because she's trying to go, starting to go crazy in her house. Now, for me, a disease case is an extreme scenario that would have built up under time, and there might even be some medical imbalance there, which we don't know. But can you just give us some tips, right, specifically when it comes to helping our medical professions ask us the right questions? Right? What we can even do to help them get into the reality of our situation when you go and visit your psychologist or your psychiatrist, what should they be looking out for? So, Rolika, this question, thank you very much for this question. The thing about this question is that uh, it, let's not even get to the stage when you go to visit the psychologist or psychiatrist. So, let's not go there. Let's, let's look at the stage of just visiting your primary health care physician or if you are pregnant, your obstetrician or OBGYN doctor. So because if you say, let's, um, when you go to a psychologist or psychiatrist, they already know what to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They already know what to do. So the primary health care physician is the person you go to. So for example, anybody that has gone for any health check this year, you will know that they will tell you, come for investigation or laboratory investigation. Maybe if, depending on your package, maybe CT scan, MRI, blood test, urine test. Yeah, as a woman, they will check for um, abdominal ultra scan and all the cancer screening and all that. It's from those results, they will not tell you, your blood count says this, your urine says this. The, um, the um, cancer screening shows no um, cancer cells and all that. So what is so difficult in saying, I want to also know my mental status. And these are all screening assessments. You have not yet made a diagnosis? No, because it's a health check. And there are screening assessments and screening tools that every organization as a hospital should actually use. They are not something bogus or out of the ordinary. Just the way you talked about you having a baby in the U.S. All of us that had babies in the U.S., we all, that experience, don't even go there. It's a different webinar on its own, you know, because a lot of us came back with postpartum depression and we're married. <laughs> so let's not go there. So the thing is that that assessment, right, there are just like 20, 10, 15 questions, depending on what they want to assess. And the basic three things that are very common worldwide when it comes to mental health, anxiety, depression, stress. And for the reason why you visit your primary health care physician on a day-to-day -day basis is 75% stress-related. So why would they just assess you and know at the impact of the stress level you are having? So I believe you as a client, you, know, you call yourself a patient, when you go to your doctor, don't be shy to ask this question because that, that is where the problem comes in. The stigma, the discrimination attached to mental illness makes us not to seek for help when we need to seek for help. Ask the doctor, okay, I've done all this test. What about my mental health? Is there no assessment for it? Mental health practitioners don't carry um, a ultrasound. We don't have theater. It's words and our knowledge. So those assessment screening tools are so important, but they are very powerful. I tell you just mark the way we did this poll. I didn't just see the result immediately. That is exactly how you know whether you are prone to anxiety, you are already depressed, and you are stressed. And that way you can then have a management plan to intervene into what you are dealing with. Because by the time it reaches the severe level, those people on the street, they have relatives. Nobody fell down from the sky. Two things go with that man or woman on the street. Either the relatives don't know where they are, or they know they don't want to associate with him or her. So we don't want to ever get to that. So I believe we can use this forum right now as mental health advocates to start demanding when you go to the hospital, I want to also check for my mental well-being. I learned there are assessment tools, uh, screening tools that I can check, I can use to know how I am doing. I think we can start from there. If I, may add, if, I, yeah. if I may add, for, for general practitioners, you could just take um, tools like the GHQ, General Health Questionnaire. It's a psychological tool. Um, you could use the brief one, the GHQ 12. Um, there are tools like the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, Hamilton Anxiety Rating Scale, and then... There are not doctors in this for a moment. I know, <laughs> but, you know, no, but the, re the, reason why I'm, the reason why I'm calling all this is because mm -hmm. they are self-reported. They are, they are things yeah. that you don't have to be skilled to use them. So, and I think it will be helpful. So if you say, uh, because your question is, how do I go to, and that's what Dr. Memuna was also saying that 
if you go to the general practitioner. So if you're a general practitioner in the house listening and all of that, you could arm, arm yourself with these tools. So when, when people you know, post um, delivery, you could offer to your patients these tools. You don't need to call in a psychiatrist yet. Just give them those tools. They are self-reporting. The Bex depression scale, those are things that people feel by themselves and you don't have to now go see. So from that, you can screen and say, okay, your test suggests that you may have um, a psycho, you may be psychologically distressed. So those are just practical tools that you can actually feel and, you know, tells you about your mental health, just like you do checks for your blood pressure, your this thing. Those are simple tools you can use. Okay. Thank you very much. So somebody, somebody wanted to clarify, it's a GHQ, general health questionnaire. Health questionnaire yeah. yeah. All right. Yes, so we can even go to our primary health care specialists and consultants and say, what about our general health questionnaire? That's something we can ask. Yeah, you okay. can ask them to have that, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. So there's a question that's come up here um, on advice for single parents. Um, I'm particularly aware that single parents may have additional burdens and single in the sense that maybe they're divorced and their spouse lives somewhere else. So they have a child sharing arrangement or maybe they're even widowed and they have children. So they're different scenarios. So what are some of maybe in your experience, coaching others, advising others, what are some of the coping strategies you can give to single parents in the house? Okay. Okay. Okay, I want to say something. Okay, okay. so um, I, I wouldn't take that question, but someone also had asked, how do I talk to my teenager who doesn't talk? You know, so there's that, someone had asked that question. That what, okay, maybe you should uh, answer that, then I'll answer so, the one for the single parent. Yes, yes. Okay, so, so let me answer that one. Um, everyone talks, that's my opinion, you know, and I've seen it over and over again. It's just that you are not touching the subject they like. So kind of go past how are you, what is happening to you, you know, all that. Just sometimes make the comment. So do play a game, you know, get to be their friend beyond just how are you? Because sometimes people say, let's talk. Then the teenager comes and then you now say, oh yeah, say something. And the person is wondering, but you are the one that said, let's talk. You know, so don't just make it, you know, let's just, you, it could be a movie night, it could be play a game, whatever in the house, do all of that and then observe the person then find what they like. Everyone talks. It's just that you are not touching the subject they really like. And then, yes, for some people, it's a bit harder. And my, my, my daughter, I noticed that for whatever reason, you know, I, I just noticed she doesn't like to talk. She's always like, so sometimes I have to tell her, you know, you have to express yourself. But what I notice is that when you go all shouty, she shuts down. So you don't want to stand in that teenager. You are not talking. You are not talking. And, and you are just... <laughs> pushing the person more so you gotta have to calm down let the person come at their pace not at your pace at their pace but make you know don't always make it about we have to talk about something important it can be something listen yeah yeah and, and, if the, and thank you so much dr Debe. i think you you hit the nail on the head and if the audience doesn't mind i actually have a blended family so my husband had a son before he had three children before we got married and I have a 14 year old son. And one of the things I found that they respond to is actually getting involved in activity. So rather than the let's talk, what's going on with you? Come, let's gather around the table. We're gonna play a game of Ludo today or we're gonna do Monopoly or I'll join you in your video game. And that helps to unlock some level of conversation. And I yeah. think that's also a useful strategy for spouses. Yeah. A lot of men don't like to hear, you know what, Dapo, we need to have a conversation <laughs> because that just creates this burden of responsibility that, oh, I'm in trouble or what has happened. So I think you make some very pertinent yeah. points. So, Dr. So, Kajiri. So, for Dr. the parenting Kajiri. thing, eh, if you, whether you're, we are focusing on single parent, but also for any other parent out there, we need to understand that in the next five, 10 years, our children are not going to be aware of how this whole COVID-19 pandemic affected us economically, um, emotionally, spiritually, and whatever. What our children are going to remind us or know about this whole pandemic is the way we made them feel. And so we need to do the needful. And it's very important that we make them 
feel wanted, supported, appreciated, and of course, connected. You must make your home climate right for your child. And how do you make sure that your home climate is right? A stress-free home, a home full of laughter, a home where everybody gets involved. It's very important. If you have two, three children, in as much as you want all of us to do a collective kind of discussion, also create time for each and every one of these children. They are unique. So I will quickly run through a parenting acronym. I'm not going to dive in. No, I won't dive in. But I'll run through a parenting acronym that whether you are a single parent, whether you have all the parents, please know that this works for all of us. P is prepared. Nobody prepared for all this. Nobody knew that this would be a major crisis, but now we know. So prepare for all the questions, all the, the, the fear, the anxiety that these children are going to have and prepare to deal with it. The A here is uh, alert. You have to be alert. Alert to know what the changes your child is going through. Alert to know, like the universities are closed down. I've had two cases of drug rehabilitation because the children started having withdrawal symptoms. The parents knew because schools are closed. So be alert. That is the A. The R here is reassurance. You need to keep reassuring your children. You need to be there for them. Whether the father is not there, you are the mom. That reassurance is very, very key. And let's not forget, we women, we have the natural nurturing hormones. That doesn't make you, that doesn't make you a bad parent if you are the one taking care of the child alone. But know that that is natural. It comes to you naturally. So reassurance is very good. The E here, so we have P-A-R-E-N. Okay, N here is non-judgmental listening. Parents know it all. Mothers know it all. Daddy knows it all. But the child is not telling you to listen, to respond. They want you to listen, to understand their point of view. Especially when it comes to our teenagers and our young adults. A lot of them are giving us attitude right now. I can tell you, I have one. I have a 17-year-old. And so you will be wanting that people are having one correct today, tomorrow, and order. Listen to them, not judgment, and that is the end. The T is time management. Make a routine, create a structure. So if you have older children, they should sweep, they should clean, they should you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Make sure you put everything in proper documentation. If you have younger children, or those that have five years below, I know how it is, it's hard, you may not have your nanny, but put a structure so you can manage your time well. Then the idea inspire them for greatness. Be their real role models. You don't want them to be the have role models outside that you, you later it becomes an issue. It is easier to nurture a healthy child than to manage a damaged adult. Mm. So you have to be you have to put that that and inspire them for greatness. The end here are for those parents that have children with special needs. So end here is for needs. I do understand that there are there will be some Parents dealing with children with special needs here, this is the time for you to look for that support group, that healthy support group to help you ensure that you, you are in, uh, in connection with the multidisciplinary approach people that are helping you manage that your child. And of course, we will not take God out of this. The G is godliness and spirituality. We need God. This is the time we all need God. All of us, because we are confused. Nobody knows when this will end. So the P-A-R-A-N-T-I-N-G, parenting, it's an acronym that we need. So yes, I forgot the E. The E here is emotionally present. You must be emotionally present for your child. And if you don't have the where we do to be emotionally present, please seek for help. Go mm. get help. Because it's you that can help your child. Once you don't have it, you can't give to your child. So if you don't have it, seek for help. Help is available. And of course, once you get it, you'll be able to. Thank you so much, Dr. Kadiri. I mean, Wimbiz, please, Secretariat, let's keep capturing these um, acronyms. It's very important. And we'll actually give the audience some actual organizations, support organizations and help centers or helplines they can call around some of these things. But I think there are just a couple of final questions. We're coming soon to the end of this hour is around that support network. And I think this is also relevant for the single parent questions for all types of family situations. How do you choose and really honing on your support network? Some people have the benefit of families, large extended families, but we know that in this climate, some of that is limited due to the social distancing restrictions. But how, what is the best way to think about building or creating a support network, Dr. Edebi? I think one of the major things anyone should look out for is um, start with the end in mind. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, be, 
And now this may not be easy, but kind of have a picture of what you want for your home. That's number one. Then number two, you have to kind of find people that share your values because many times, I, I, you know, value is very important. Someone said that a common past may be important or a common past may be great. We may share a common past, that's great, but a common future is more important and more valuable. You need to look in terms of this person I'm connecting with. So you could, the, the truth is this, I was talking with a group of people yesterday that have you seen siblings that they, they come from the same home, but their values are different. The way they see, like, in fact, I know a particular person who said, my, I can't even have a decent conversation with my twin brother because while I am here interacting with presidents, um, world, world leaders, my, my brother is talking about tie that we used to roll tire with where, while growing up. He cannot connect with me on the same level. So you want to look out for people that share your values. It's not just enough to just say, I just want my child to be this. If the person does not share your value, values are very important. So find those people connect with them. Now, let me also say that sometimes connecting with people may not be that you may have them physically present in your life. So sometimes you may just know them from afar. So it's like um, you watch their videos, you read their books and all that, and you model your kids after that. And then the most important thing at the end of the day is that you yourself must be a model. Parenting cannot be outsourced. You know, one of the definitions of parenting is that you are involved. Once you are not involved, you are not parenting. You are a, you are, you are, I don't know what to call that. A bystander. <laughs> yeah, you know, so parenting takes involvement. You have to be involved. You must have a definition of what you want. So that's why I said start with the end in mind. You know, don't just, let's just be going whatever um, um, happens will happen because that's what a lot of people do. They, they just keep up with the Joneses. They just keep up with what everyone else is doing. They don't, they've not. So take time to find your own values. Take time to find what you want out of life and then begin to find those people. And the, the beautiful thing about nature or life is that it kind of supplies you with the resources that you need when you have identified it. But yeah. if you have not identified it, you are, you are scattered all over. So that's my own advice on finding that. Thank you, Thank you very much. And it resonates with what you said before about information, yeah. you know, at the beginning. That's, yeah. that's very, very important. Um, I just had, I guess, two more questions. And I'd like you to also both wrap up, sort of give your final thoughts and insights. And the two questions are around, first of all, Dr. Kadiri. What are the daily routines a woman can do or take very simple practical on a day-to-day -day basis? Because I always say that sometimes we can just only see today and deal with what we need to do. Don't let's worry about tomorrow. So can you give us some practical, very briefly concise tips for daily routines and then wrap up for us? And then Dr. Idebi, after she's spoken, I want you to sort of speak to those women who actually have spouses that are going through depression or struggling emotionally now? Because those men may not be able to voice what the issues and how can we help our men actually get in touch with their emotions so that they can speak and communicate with us, which will make for a better, healthy relationship. So I'll, I'll start with Dr. Kadiri first. I think we, can, we can go with the WIMBY's acronym. Anybody can easily go with the WIMBY's acronym on a day-to-day -day basis. Truly, the first thing is, let's even put up the top-notch um, key factors of emotional intelligence, self-awareness, self-management. Of course, now empathy, which is social awareness, knowing other people's emotions and then be able to manage it and get motivated. The truth is that as a human being, you must see yourself as unique. You are different. Don't compare. Comparison brings a lot of anxiety and stress. So you need to understand who you are, what you are, what are my stressors, and how do I manage them? Because your stress is not my stress. If you are bringing on board that you have financial stress, somebody will tell you that, no, I don't have that issue. So you see what I mean? So if we go with the WIMBY's acronym, the W is worry less and live in the present. Use your past to build the pebbles you want to see in the future for while 
living in the present. That way it keeps you grounded. It keeps you alive. It keeps you focused and it does not deviate you from your set goals. Very, very key. Of course, the eye is the sleep. Sleep is so important that with poor quality or lack of sleep, you are useless. Burnout. So you see yourself as a biggest asset. And that is the reason why you must make sure you do not burn out. Because the moment you burn out, you are going to be useless to yourself and useless to somebody. And so sleep is so key because it refreshes you. It, it, it gets the nerves and the body gets renewed. It gets, when you sleep, you are growing. When you mm. sleep, you are burning calories. So everything revolves about sleep. Then, of course, the end is maintaining healthy diet. Those are basic things we should do every day. Healthy diet does not mean that you have to go to the shop to buy all the fruits and vegetables and all that. We also do know that there are some foods that are not good for you as a human being because of the type of person you are. Maybe some underlying medical condition. So maybe pineapple has too much of natural sugar and maybe some fruits are too acidic for you. But you know, maintain that healthy diet just means that find what works for you. And of course, make sure you, you know, ensure that the calorie count and eating portion is very key. The B, of course, be a part of community. You are already a part of the Wimpy's community. What about your church? What about your um, estate? What about your school? Some just be a part. Community keeps us connected. We are social animals. We are social beings. And you cannot be isolated and keep yourself isolated. Connect. That is the idea. And of the idea be that the idea is exercise. We know it boosts our happy hormones, endorphins. So include it in your day-to-day -day activities. You know, and the Z is zoom out. Zoom out. Not all webinars are meant for you. Don't be pressured into learning a skill. If the only way you can cope now is to look inward and relate it to your internal clock. Because mm. if you keep your internal clock in check, it will help you filter out the external challenges so you need to know when to zoom in when to zoom out and you know staying alive is the most and topmost thing on our clock right now keep it simple and take these simple steps every day purpose you know anything you are doing that is not fun is stress so find what works for you thank you so much dr kadri <laughs> very strong passing words so dr Debbie. Um, a response to that question I threw out in your parting words so I can wrap up, yes. Okay. Well, first thing I would say is that sometimes being a man can be a lonely um, thing, can be quite lonely because sometimes it's difficult by nature. Um, some men find it difficult to express themselves, to talk, and then um, your society has expectations, um, you have expectations, you know, and uh, so it can be lonely sometimes. So this is what I would say to the ladies to help. You know, and like you said, sometimes men are dealing with depression. Let me give a personal, um, uh, at this point, I remember growing up, then I was, of course, growing up, I wasn't a psychiatrist, but I remember I would have, sometimes my dad would come to our room, lie on our bed and pretend he's sleeping. Because I, I know he was pretending because he would have his eyes shut in a very interesting way. I didn't used to understand why he used to do that. But now that I'm a psychiatrist and looking back, I think those were moments where he was dealing with his own struggles and felt lonely and had nobody to, because you have to be the man, you have to be strong for everybody sometimes. You know, the same thing for the women, but we're talking about how do you support your husband? This is what I would say. Number one, um, ask him, how can I help? You know, how can I help? listen even to when he's not talking listen and then ask in clear terms how can i help another thing i would say is speak kind words over your husband sometimes all he needs to hear you know someone told me a story how the husband lost his job came home and she was like you know you can't sit down here you have to get up you have to move and i said that's not the time to tell him that he's he's drained he's ashamed he's Dean, sometimes you need to just tell him, you know you are going to get out of this. You are a strong man. You are a great man. You know, speak to the king inside of him. Someone said, in every man there's a fool. In every man there's a king. The one you speak to is the one you will see. So learn to speak over your husband. Speak kind words to your husband. Then number three, kind of make the environment receptive. Kind enough for him to talk. Sometimes you don't have to push, 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 you know, to get him to talk. Let him feel comfortable 
you know, um, to be able to find peace in his home. Some people say, well, my husband is always going out and all that. I'm not blaming you. I'm not saying it's on you. You are just trying to express yourself. But sometimes there is peace in quiet, you know, just learning to be quiet and allowing him to be um, find his home as a place to come and be comfortable with. I mean, let it be so comfortable. Your husband is is can be vulnerable with you, can cry. You know, in the world, he can't cry out there, but he should be able to say, you know, I'm scared. It shouldn't just be, you should say, I'm, I'm scared. I don't know what to do. I don't know how I'm going to address this. Sometimes, and then also be a solution provider. Because men speak for information. Women talk for affection. So sometimes just telling him that you are going to work out and you are not telling him practical things to do, it doesn't help his mind. You know, sometimes you may need to literally weigh in by saying, you know what, I have this um, resource here, I have this connection, or I have this money somewhere, and I'm, I'm, going, I'm willing to assist. So it's not just enough to just, you know, just be there. You need to give him practical um, solutions yeah. on how he can get out. And then the last thing I would say is pray for him. You know, sometimes you do all of these things, it's very difficult. And um, then let me quickly add also, someone recently reached out to me and was telling me about the mental health of her husband. And I told her certain things and I said, engage him. And interestingly, you know, they've been married for many years. He had this mental health condition, was trying to hide it from her. But when she went to, when I told her, just take these steps, talk to him this way, talk to him that way. He was actually excited that finally I can be vulnerable with you. You know, yeah. that, he, that was his greatest fear that I can't reveal to you. He had mm. been seeing a psychiatrist for years, but he was afraid to tell his wife that I have this medical condition. So just make the place, you know, don't say things like, you know, you behave like you are, you are something wrong with you. Just say, you make me feel, you know, make that home comfortable. And just like a man sometimes like a child, he he's, he's careful to come out to reveal his weakness. Mm. So see him like that, make it comfortable, pray for him, speak kind ones over him. And Thank trust you. me, you will have the best of your man. Thank you so much, Dr. Debbie. I'm sure the women could have a whole nother webinar on relationships. But one thing you struck that struck me from what you said is that men seek for information, women seek for affection. And I think it's really just to realize that this is a partnership and we have to help each other to help ourselves, right? So, I mean, this has been a fantastic discussion. And honestly, guys, I don't know how I'm going to wrap this all. I'm not going to be able to wrap up all the acronyms, but I will try with the ones I remember. I first of all want to thank Dr. Kadiri and Dr. Edibi. We do not take your wealth of experience for granted at all. It has been pretty insightful and amazing and the feedback so far has been fantastic. So ladies, just a few things that I picked up that I wanted to leave with you. Right at the top of the hour, the first hour, Dr. Edebi mentioned the importance of mental resilience and he mentioned five tools. You can get the full 10 tools on his, on his webinar, which I'll post in the chat uh, very shortly. But he mentioned basically the issue of getting information. The second point was re-evaluating, so get some perspective. Then he mentioned the importance and power of connection, not just with people around you, but actually actively listening and communicating with people. Then the power of positive affirmations and the power of confession as well, which is closely related. And then I think the final thing that he mentioned was also the importance of meditation. Then when we look at what Dr. Kadiri said, she mentioned the importance of finding joy in the present and living in the present in this current uh, mode. And also moving from this idea of survival to thriving. I can certainly tell you that from my own personal experience, I realized, for instance, I cannot replicate the, the schooling that my child receives in school. So I can only do my best as a mom in that present moment. So what did she say about the acronyms? The acronyms were as follows. The W, if I remember correctly, was worry less. Imbibe good sleeping habits, that's the I. Then all as well, it was about taking care of your diet and watching your diet. Then B, being part of a community. I, including 30 minutes daily exercise. And Z was around zooming out. So they also gave us some resources that would be quite useful for all of us in this season to sort of take care. We can reach out to places like the Warren Rose Foundation. Wimbys can post it in the chat. Places like the Quiet Place. 
Grace Hill Palace Hospital, Place Hospital as well, also has programs around that. And I would also encourage you to go and watch Dr. Debbie's 10 tools on the webinar link that will also be posted in the chat. The other thing we have to mention is that an evaluation link will be sent to you all in the follow-up email. So please endeavor to fill that link. We want to hear your opinion on how this webinar went and what we should do for next time. Once again, Wimbis thanks its amazing sponsors, Julia Jacks Consulting, Tozali Magazine, and of course, Travel Lab Nigeria Limited. We certainly hope that you enjoy the session. We look forward to hearing from you all and we're going to try and share as many of the resources that were mentioned on this call with you in the follow-up conversation. Please reach out, very, very important. I see that Dr. Edebi has just posted his link on building mental resilience for optimum productivity by Dr. Edebi. And I'm sure Dr. Kadiri will also share some of the resources that she thinks will be useful. You can share it with the WIMBY Secretariat, ma'am. So I guess the parting words I leave you with is, Take care of yourself. Your physical health is just as, if not more important than as your mental health, right? Your mental health, sorry, is just as, if not more important than your physical health and they have to work hand in hand. Thanks for joining us and giving us your precious, precious afternoon. It's been amazing sharing this ride with you. Thank you once again, Dr. Kadiri. We appreciate you. Dr. Debbie, we appreciate you. Thank you, my Wimbe sisters for your presence and your engagement. And until next time, stay safe and God bless. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye-bye, <laughs> Bye -bye, Dr. Mimuna. <laughs> Bye-bye, Debbie. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone.